suddenly trapped in IMC with a bonus, special lightning everywhere with your Piper. <laughs> right wing, front, everything with my students and get trapped and I call Pia Labor. Uh, we got heavy thunderstorm. Uh, I just asked them, are, are we around the south? That's the most important part. Otherwise, we cannot make it, right? I don't have weather radar, I'm not on the IFR, I just fly VF, VFR and suddenly trap and I call, we change to IFR. I don't know the procedure here, whether we can change that right away like in US, like we did before, remember? We just changed it and that became viral. That's my huge mistake. And a lot of Americans, pilot, event examiner, FAA aviation inspectors, take a look to that videos and I drop it down. Really? Yeah. It's become a big issue in the, I think, East Coast FAA. Oh, right. Because, uh, I'll, I'll, because that, that was my mistake. We pick up the clearance after we enter the clouds. I see. That's a problem, right? Okay. So we, we talk about that later. But that will happen, this thing. Then I got trapped in the clouds, lightning everywhere, and my student is freezing out. What should we do? Not just relax, it's easy. But I don't see I scare, I start to pray, right? Because of the lightning. <laughs> <laughs> then I asked Pia Labor, just put me in front of the final runway to one. And we take IFR, so we land safely, the ceiling was low and the thunderstorm. We don't afraid about the ceiling, but we're afraid about the cells, right? So why do we need instrument rating? Like I said before, instrument rating is like your insurance, that's your best investment in your life. You you don't need commercial license if you're not flying for a commercial. But definitely, if you want to become a better pilot, you will get your instrument. So if I have to choose one word about instrument rating, it's all about the management. Instrument rating is management that will train you to become a precise pilot, safer pilot, right? From now till you fly the Airbus A380, you're gonna fly IFR, instrument, right? So that's the point for um, for tonight. So I fly twin engines. I fly the, the Citation 5 for now and do some tr uh, training on the commercial single engine. Sorry, instrument. I teach people to fly instrument too. And I learn a lot when I teach my students special instrument. That's why I share a lot about the ADF. Because the key of instrument flying is your decision making. Learning about instrument, you will learn to abort your flight. That's the worst thing. When I was in private, I don't know anything, I just happy to fly. Fly, 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 don't care about the weather, don't care about anything. Then the more I learned, the more I jump deeper on the instrument, okay, I don't have any options other than cancel my flight. That happened like two months ago when I have to fly from Van Nuys to Santa Barbara. It's only like 75 miles or something. Yeah. And we plan to fly a little bit uh, on the offshore, like maybe to Santa Maria and San Jose. But the whole uh, west of California, southern California, has become icy. So I call the weather, uh, the breather, right? You have that in the US that they said there will be air mat zoom on your end route. Then what are you gonna do? Right, IMC. Mm. The first is IMC, air mat. Air mat is the, um, the significant weather, like the important weather, significant weather for every pilot who flies small airplane. There will be like three air mat, the icing, the turbulence, and the monsoon operation. It means that IMC. So the IMC is fine, we can fly. We are instrument rating pilot, right? But the icing, when we fly like Piper or Cessna, you are not certified for the icing. You don't have a boot, you don't have the icing system. And that moment, then we cancel our flight. I have to postpone the whole day because the icing will fail it until 24 hours. Okay? How, how, how can I decide that? Because I learn about decision making on the IFR flight. You can fly, if the feasibility becomes zero, it doesn't matter. You have like amazing avionics, you use G1000, 
right? But the icing. So the question is, if you take instrument rating to fly when the feasibility becomes zero, what's the biggest enemy of instrument pilot? The answer is icing. So that's the first introduction. Why do you need to become instrument rating pilot? Because you love your family, you want to go home safely, of course, right? And you want to extend your option. You cannot fly PFR, but you can fly IFR. But who wants to fly IFR if there's IMC? That's why I keep asking, why you need instrument rating? While the weather coming, you cancel your flights. So what's the point? So the point is, just, just in case you trap in the adverse condition, then you can bring them home safely. And number three is, what is the biggest enemy of instrument rating pilot? The answer is icing. Okay? So any moment, any time, if you have the visible moisture and the temperature is like about 2 degrees, 3 degrees until minus 7, there's a huge chance you got icing. Then icing will kill you. So that's three things that you have to consider. You got the privilege to fly under IMC, but you cannot fly on the icing with a zero feasibility inside the clouds in a really scary moment. All right, makes sense? Okay, so <clears throat> you can be on the VFR limitations and cloud is not no longer your enemy. Enjoy the full surface of the ATC. What I like from instrument is I don't I don't need to care about the airspace, I don't care about the traffic, because once you IMC, the responsibility for the sea and the void is transferred to the ATC. Flying in the US is really complicated on the airspace, a lot of airspace violation. So if you fly like 300 miles, 400 miles, it's easier for you to fly instrument because they take care of all about your airspace, even though you have to pass through the Bravo airspace, mm -hmm. like you flying Long Beach, a lot of Bravo airspace, right? We have flight following. Yeah, flight following. Then right away in the ground, because flight following wherever you go, right? They settle with that. So it's same with the instrument. You fly along to San Francisco or wherever, then practically, if the weather becomes VMC, then you will cancel the IFR anytime and you become visual approach. So that's what I mean. You want to enjoy the full surface of ATC in routing, departure, and approach. They take care of your flight. Okay? So I believe a lot of people here, uh, some of you already jumped to the, the instrument rating training. You, you got your instrument, right? But we are talking about the FAA instrument standard, and I'll share why FAA is, uh, I mean, like more practicable and more reasonable, okay? But how to get instrument rating? For my standard, I always uh, motivate my students to, to, to complete their knowledge tests before they even touch the airplane for the instrument training. <coughs> You know, a lot of people stumble around, they're flying, right? And finally, they cannot get their instrument because they don't complete their knowledge test. And they will find a hard time to understand the whole concept of the regulation if they don't do the knowledge test. That's why I always suggest just get the knowledge test done and fly, okay? So five minutes after you get your private, you can start officially learn about instrument rating fly with the double line, and you can lock the hours, fly under the hood. Anyone know how many hours you need? Fly under the view limiting device? 40 hours. So everything about the instrument rating and the 61, 65, that's all the regulation you need to learn about, okay? And then you need to have 50 hours pilot in command. Cross country. So what is cross country? Anyone? that everybody become bankrupt, huh? <laughs> we have to fly to Penang and coming back for each. <laughs> How about you? What is cross country? This is like from point A to point B. That's definitely the definition is if you're flying from here to Senai, that's cross country, right? But if you're looking for the 61.1, that's the specific definition for cross country 
if you are taking the cross country for your aeronautical experience toward your wedding or certificate, there will be minimum 50 miles. Five zero miles from point A to point B straight line. So you cannot done go to uh, Semai and you do a touch and go or do a um, Gunung Kulai for maneuvering. You fly more than 50, but the straight line is only 18 miles. So that not count. Remember, when you go to the check ride, the first thing, the examiner will take a look on your logbook, whether you have the cross-country pilot in command, 50 hours. And they will take a look to your route. If he is not really uh, familiar with that route, they will open four flights, sky factor, they just put it, they need a straight line, 50 miles distance. Okay? And then 40 hours flying with a few limiting device. Simulated. You're flying two hours, Maybe you fly like 1.8 because the 0 0.2 you have to put off the hood and land, right? So it's uh, 40 hours and knowledge stats 70% minimum score. It's easy. Now we already discussed the biggest enemy for IFR is icing and the other one is spatial disorientation by unqualified pilot. Why we say unqualified? I just lost my friend. His name is Mark. He's a nice guy. And his daughter is pretty, is really pretty girl, and he fly hawkers and some jets, right? He also like contract pilot. So one day it's like it happened on April 2017. I flew with him several, and my parents jumped too. So he flew with uh, the other guy, his friend, with whole family on board. Fly with I, I don't I don't know the, the, that's a single engine, the bigger plane, maybe Saratoga or. or the, the bigger the bigger uh, piston on single engine the new avionics I think Garmin 530 he is not too familiar with that okay and he take chances he fly it and got trapped in IMC he changed to IFR that seems right right you have to change to uh, IFR if you cannot maintain the separation with the cloud and what happened he I think he was busy People think that he was busy with the avionics because he was not too familiar with the new Garmin 530. And guess what? He owned like 5,000 hours. And he lost his life and all friends. Crash. So it looked like stall, spin, and boom. How can a 5,000 hours pilot who fly jets when he flew a single engine piston got trapped in the spatial disorientation? Because everybody can get in that situation. That's why FAA now uh, they have like I'm safe checklist. Right? If you are consuming the alcohol, you don't. And you don't sleep well. Right? That's the biggest risk. That's why if you look to the NTSB report, I think 85%. The VFR pilot, the private pilot, dies because of the spatial disorientation. Do you know why? Why people get trapped on that situation? They're trapped in what? The, the situation is in spatial the disorientation. Yeah. They don't know that spatial disorientation. Because what? they don't learn the weather. So that's the biggest thing in the IFR. On the check ride, you have to know the weather. As a private pilot, normally they just fly. Weather, sky is blue. Just shoot the flight. I don't care about the weather, right? But if you fly like 400 miles, weather changes. Every 30 minutes, it could be changed. How about if the front, the high pressure system coming and bring all the marine layer, right? And there's occluded front, give you like embedded thunderstorm. You don't have any equipment to predict that. And at the first time, you don't even care about the weather. So you think that, all right, uh, I got three hours training on my private. FAA, you got three hours under fuel limiting device training. It's not instrument training, but in the commercial, it's specifically 10 hours instrument training toward the commercial. But on the private pilot, it's only three hours under fuel limiting device. It doesn't mean you learn about the instrument. And they count on that. They think that, okay, I learned about three hours, then mm, this is just a cloud. What's the difference between who and the real actual IMC. The actual IMC is different. I found a lot of students when 
when I put them on the simulator, right? In the simulator, when I move the panel to close all, and there's a VMC on the side window, they will use their very fellow vision to adjust the, the, the orientation. But when I change all the wires become white, I found that they cannot fly well. So what happened with your view limiting device? We can fly with a uh, very fellow vision that will help you. And sometimes when you use that, you can take a look, right? You, you try to find out. But if you fly under a really wide, wide screen, it's completely different and you will get your spatial disorientation. Even my friend, 5,000 hours died. And we feel really bad, okay? So these two things you have to remember, even though you are instrument rating pilot. You are current, but doesn't mean you're proficient. A lot of people think, okay, I've done the uh, six approaches. Right? Six instrument approaches, holding, intercepting, and tracking. That's the basic within six months. And I can't even do it on the AATD, in the simulator. Then you feel that you are done. I'm current. But the question is, are you proficient? Okay, a lot of people die because of that. Okay, I fly with my safety pilot, I using a uh, hood, and my senior uh, I he said to me, as a low hour CF I, what is less than 2,000 hours teaching the instrument, never take your students and teach them on the IMC. Because he just lost his friend two years ago, 10,000 hours CFI, CFII, MEII, died because he teached his student on the IMC and the students got troubles. I mean, I don't know what happened, but they crashed because of speed. So that can happen to everyone. Right? So always think, your current doesn't mean you're proficient. Especially when you fly diamond, you fly with the G1000, a lot of colors, a lot of sophisticated instruments. That will lead you to a major disaster. So that's why I always teach the new students to fly the six packs. Because that's the basic core fundamental. When you go to the 777, the Airbus, that will be easy because you know the basic. Okay. G1000 is not easy. You know that, right? No. It's not easy, right? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I think it's easy. Easy? Those who started with G1000, they go to six packs, they cannot. Okay. <laughs> For me, until today, I still find it difficult to fly G1000. Yeah, I fly DA40 and... Yeah, I, I, I prefer to fly the six packs, mm. but use a four flight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the four flight is easier than G1000. Okay? So, what is the fundamental of instrument flying? That's a new ball game for everyone. We have three things here. What is that? What are they? Cross check, mm -hmm. instrument identification, and cross check. What is that? Scanning. Mm -hmm. Instrument cross check, interpretation, and aircraft control. So, what, when I'm talking about the proficient, is all about this. The other biggest enemy of instrument grading pilot is fixation. You just focus on one thing and you forget one thing. When you start to deal with this, the other problem comes. Then you try to solve that problem and the other problem comes. You maintain your VSI, you, get, uh, you got a better airspeed, but you lost your heading. You try to maintain your heading, you lost your altitude. Now you try to maintain your altitude, you lost your airspeed. And you stumble around with that and you just crash. So the things that you have to practice is this. Instrument cross-check. I always use the rule every two seconds. Never see the instrument more than two seconds. All right, and then interpretation. What happens if you have a vacuum failure? Anyone? What are you gonna get? Mm -hmm. Anyone get a real Vacuum failure? No. Yeah. Berlin, right? No, no, no. You, you said it? Yeah, from Berlin got one. Right. And this, uh, the vacuum failure is not on the red bird. It's, I mean, in the same, you can just shut it down or close it 
with the paper, that's it. No. The problem is your flying IMC and your vacuum field is smoothly turned and become airless. It's like take maybe two minutes until the until the gyro stop, right? And then just become slow, slow, slow like that. You feel that okay, it doesn't make sense, right? You turn right and then hmm. Until you realize you're already back like this. That's happened in Adam Air. Anyone hear about Adam Air? In, in Indonesia? Their IRS failed. And both pilots busy with all overhead panels. Autopilot off. Flying flying with the 0.78 mark. And then the airplane become like this. And the jet spin. When you spin the Airbus, or I think 737, I, I read about that. When you spin that plane, you will need 35,000 feet to recover. Then, if you spin at 30,000, there's no way you to recover, especially under the swept wing. So, this really major things. And after you check, you interpret, then you take decision to control the airplane, to give an input for the airplane. Okay? So, that's the three fundamentals. Hmm. If you're flying VFR, you don't even care. I fly 2,000, uh, fire labor give me 1,500, you fly 1,700, who cares? If they shout at you, just say sorry, right? But instrument, anyone know the limitation? Plus minus 100, that's your border. Especially, especially if you're flying the Victor Airways draw, join with the airlines, they will kill you if you fly like more than 200. That's why they're taking care of us and we have to be really precise. That's why earlier I say that this is all about the management and to teach you to become a precise pilot. See ya. Bye-bye. So there are six okay. items here. Um, VFR versus IFR. Now you can see the outside. You cannot see the outside. 90% of the time must be inside. Situation awareness and the mental picture is the hardest part of instrument pilot, right? So you're under the hood and you have to know where's the runway, where's your radio. So I assume that everyone here is understand about the radio. You know about the radio stuff, the VOR, the basic, right? You know when you get lost, how to get back to, um, let's say, Senai, you flew to Senai before? Senai? No, uh, Senai. Oh, Zor? Uh, yes. Yeah. Let's say you trap in the IMC here and you want to back to Zenai. Do you know the easiest way to go there? Check to the VOR. Yeah. And you know how to use that, right? Yeah. Okay. So a lot of people get lost. The situation awareness and the mental picture just getting worse and worse when the weather has become bumpy, right? So in the visual, you can just go up and see, but here now everything is white. So you're only helpful things is your VOR. Make sense? Then you have to know where is your position. Number two, you must comply 100 feet altitude maximum deviation and cruising speed 5% or 10 knots, whichever is higher during cruising. So the, the speed itself must be at least 10 knots, otherwise you have to report. No freedom of flying anymore. That's why I don't like IFR actually if I want to fly for a burger. I don't, I don't fly far because I lost my freedom. I have to follow that. I cannot, I cannot go, I want to see that, see this, right? And they watch you every step, but it's safer. And aircraft equipment is different. Okay. The, the, the IFR is when you fly with the VFR plus the IFR. That's a required equipment on the airplane. So anyone can give me um, the feedback, what, what kind of equipment that we need to fly IFR? DME. DME? So uh, do you have DME on your Piper? Okay. But um, the Cessna? No, right? So can I use that to fly IFR, the Cessna? Yes or no? No. Is yes? No. Because there's no DME? Okay. The question is, do we need DME? 
No. No? Yes, we need. Mm -hmm. If you fly flight level 240 or above, you're not gonna fly there, right? So that's the thing, okay? DME, that's for flight level 240 and above. So yes, you can fly that. What else? Generator. Generator. What else? Radios. Radios. Anyone, not you, you know everything already. <laughs> you are on your IPC track. <laughs> okay, the radio. Obviously, you only need like one VOR to fly, right? And one communication, two-way communication. But some airports, some approach, like St. Anna, John Wayne, you know John Wayne? Yeah, I've been there. Okay, you've been there, right? The LS20, right? It's required two VOR. So you cannot select that approach if you only have one VOR. It depends on the approach procedures you choose, right? What else? Altimeter and attitude indicator. So if you're on the ground and then your attitude indicator deflect five degrees or more, then you cannot fly. And your altimeter, if the differential more than 75, then the airport elevation based on the current local altimeter setting, you cannot go. How about the VSI? When you taxi, then the VSI become like minus 100. Can you go? You go? Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. Talk? Just the VSI is zero. Okay. VSI is not mandatory. So every time you fly and the VSI becomes minus 100, that will be your new zero. So who cares about the VSI? You always have speed to define your rate of descent, right? Okay, so what else? Clock. You must always have a clock, the timer, and the ball. See the ball? And rate of turn indicator. So when you have electronic, uh, the electron, the, sorry, the turn coordinator, everybody aware about turn coordinator, right? How it works? Mm -hmm. How it works? What's the source of gyro? Is a vacuum or? Electric. Electric gyro. That's why every time you turn on the battery, you hear the noise, that's a gyro, all right? So that's the equipment that required for the IFR. So the VFR plus the IFR, the, there's a mnemonic, grab card. G is for generator, R is for radio, right? A is for attitude indicator, and B is for ball, C is for clock, A is for altimeter, R is for rate of turn, and D is for DME, flat level. To board zero or above. So that's the thing. That's the aircraft equipment is different. So when you get a failure on any equipment, this is, works on your VFR too. So you got inoperative. What are you gonna do? Now you have your um, one of equipment. Let's say it's VSI, right? Out of service. The VSI just drop more than hundred or maybe five hundred something like that. And IMC there. What are you going to do? So I will blend this course with the uh, ADM, the aeronautical decision making, give you the workflow, how to identify, mitigating the risk, right? So you got that problem, you. Mm. So I can still fly partial panel. Like, I still know which- Partial panel? Like, I can still, I can still get back safely with, with one equipment out. So I just need to be aware of like- which Okay, so how, how you get, how, how exactly the workflow to check whether you can go with that item or not? Hmm. Let's say tomorrow you're gonna fly, right? Everybody here is current to fly, right? So tomorrow you take the Piper or Cessna and some instrument out. How you define whether you go or not? The first step is minimum equipment list, right? Do we have minimum equipment list? Just the grab card. Yes, mm -hmm. Anyone? Let's talk about that after this, okay? Do we have Mal? We do. You do? Yeah. Okay. Do we have Mal? You can't Mal. What is Mal? Minimum equipment. What is that? The minimum equipment that you need to fly. 
top the minimum equipment that could be inoperative and you can still fly right that's why we minimum equipment lease mm. but the question is do we have mel the answer is sale airplane he has mel mm. but for us no we don't have mel what we have is the 91 205 Okay, there's a tomato flex and a great grab car under 91205. If there's nothing there about your equipment, you will go to 91213 because the 91213 is the mother. Must be VFR day certification, must be AD compliant, right? Must be 91205. And if there's nothing there, what are you gonna do? Where are you gonna check? You will go to your POH. Take a look to your equipment list. They're specific there, like stall warning. Do you, do you need stall warning? Is there any stall warning in the 91205? No stall warning, but it's required under the equipment list. There you cannot go if your stall warning gone, right? And if there's nothing there, what are you going to do? Then you go to the type certificated data sheet. You can go to the FAA website for the specific model. You download the TCDS. And you take a look at your model, your serial number. Then you find any specific the equipment that must be operated. If there's nothing there, then it's become on your personal minimum judgment. For me, I like VSI because if I shoot the ILS, I will hit the VSI as my primary. The VSI <coughs> will give me airspeed. Okay, you can calculate from the slope of the ILS. Three degrees angle of the glide slope will give you like five to six hundred VSI. As long as you maintain that, your airspeed will be good. If you take a look to the airspeed, your airspeed is going higher. I believe I can bet your VSI was going like 800 to 1000, right? So if the VSI, my VSI out and I have to fly IMC instrument, I'm not going. That's my personal minimums. So that's how you're mitigating the risk of flying based on the inoperative equipment, <coughs> okay? So that's instrument, okay? So in IFR flying is not about flying the needle, and shield the approach, but it's a new philosophy of well flying management, thinking few steps ahead. That's the main problem for the VFR pilot transition to the IFR. You were really busy to set up your cockpit management, set all the frequencies. When you are on the final approach fix, you start to descend to land, you're gonna think about what I'm gonna do in my missed approach. So a lot of people say, every pilot, the goal is to do a go around. The landing is just a bonus. Okay, so you always think about how, if this, how, if that. So always think like two steps ahead. You never think like, okay, I just, that's a runway. I just go there and your ceiling is like 1,000. You clear out of the ceiling. That's my runway, okay, I throw away the charts. Boom, I don't need the chart. That's a runway, right? And suddenly there's a um, animal, there's a dog. And the ADC is go around and you go around and you go back to the clouds. And you find out that you just throw your chart away. <laughs> then you mess up around looking there and you get caught. So that's the philosophy. You always plan for the miss. <clears throat> right? While you're maintaining the needle, you have to think about the miss. Just in case you have to hold where you have to hold. Actually, we never hold. Did you ever hold? Uh, like, yeah, I mean, after, uh, before a lot of people hold now, right? Yeah, yeah because of traffic. Uh, after go down? No, never. They just give back to you to back, right? Yeah. So, holding is good before, but, yeah. Nobody will use it for the miss approach. They will help you to land right away, okay? So, IFR has a wider range of weather limitation than VFR. The basic VFR weather minimum is no longer applies. My question is, the visibility there is, let's say you're flying IFR, right? The visibility is hmm, uh, like 200 feet. Can you fly, take off? 
IFR? Do we have a minimum for takeoff? How about you? So, that's a good question. Huh? A lot of people think, it's, why there's a minimum? I'm a IFR pilot, who cares? So yeah, there's no minimum for part 91, but for you, it's a one mile. The part 121, 135 is one mile, but if you fly like A380, 747 with four engines or three engines like a Falcon, you have half miles limitation. But as the part 91 pilot, will you fly with the 200 feet visibility? That will be an unsafe, right? You're a reckless pilot. That's why it's the always good practice to upgrade yourself to become to absorb the limitation of higher standard like 135 or 121. But for the landings, let's talk about the ILS. So everyone familiar with the ILS, right? What is ILS? Just the system that guide you down to the runway, maybe 200 feet above the runway. The question is, if you're flying IFR and you shoot ILS, what is your landing feasibility minimums? Do you have a minimums? What is airport minimums? Now you're flying in the Senai, ILS Zulu, or yeah, whatever ILS there. Do you have minimums? The feasibility? Mm -hmm. Approach? The, the problem is the approach is not showing you the feasibility minimums. Because uh, as long as you, uh, once you hit the MDA, uh, the, uh -huh. uh, oh yeah, the, the, the DA, and prior to that, uh, you can see environment, runway run visual environment. Lighting. But you why you shoot the approach if on the cruise level, mm -hmm. you already know the feasibility on the airport? You maybe want to divert before you shoot the approach. Uh, you are asking if we ask what, what is the what is the problem? What is the minimum? Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a there's a number there, right? But what is the general of the ILS? What is the minimum um, feasibility? No. All right. The category one ILS, right? The minimum is twenty four hundred feet RVR. It's like half miles, right? You can go lower, like mm, eighteen hundred. If you are using the flat director or under the uh, using a hut, yeah, you can you can use that. But normally category one, the feasibility minimum is half miles. So if you're now you're cruising, then you pick up the the ATIS and you get the ATIS, the feasibility less than half miles. What are you gonna do? You want to try shoot until GA? Diver, right? Maybe you hold or read the tab. Make sense? So that's the basic thing. You know your takeoff limitation, you know your landing limitation. What is the feasibility minimum? A lot of people think that I'll say, okay, I can just go down until DA and then I shoot again. Why you shoot the, the approach if you know you're not gonna make it because there's the feasibility is lowest, right? Even the ceiling. How if the ceiling is lower than the DA? Why should you, why you have to shoot the approach? So that's what I mean, we think like two steps ahead. Why we have to pick up the ATIS? Anyone here when flying to Johor pick up the ATIS? No? <laughs> I always pick up the ATIS. When I call the pile labor and when they move us to Johor, I will inbound with echo, inbound with whatever. All right? You always do that, even though it's like only 10 miles, don't care. The weather changes. So you have to know. Always tune the the ATIS one two three zero five. Yeah. Always tune the ATIS. All right, get information. So that's about the weather minimums. I think um, for the the end route, this doesn't matter. You can fly with the zero visibility unless there's no icing. Then go. What to do if you fly inside the clouds and the temperature now is let let's say it's 20, 20 degrees. 18 degrees, maybe you fly like 9,000. I flew to Hat Yai that time. I flew a diamond from here, uh, 11,000 feet, and temperatures goes down to like 11 or 12 degrees something. So what are you gonna do? You fly inside the clouds. You know there's a clouds there, right? Yeah. 
Try, try to divert out. Your IFR. There's an alternative song. Mm -hmm. This is my IFR. Uh, IFR is it? Yeah. yeah you already IFR. You, you fly IFR and then you have to fly inside the clouds. So what is the viewpoint? The temperature is high and the viewpoint is high. Mm -hmm. So what happens if the temperature and dew point spread is become like the same? Then you uh, watch out for Alright, no. Whenever the temperature and dew point become same, the visible moisture is come, right? The, the the air cannot hold anymore. It's like a Harry Potter's you know the blanket of Harry Potter? You put it there and you become invisible and you put it out and you can out so that's where the air. So temperature and the dew point become same, you see the cloud haze, whatever. Right? The problem is the clouds are already there and you go through that way. What's the best course of action? Turn on your anti-icing. Just stand by for the car heat. Stand by, right? If you're flying diamond, you don't need car heat. You fly that old Flintstone shit, you always need the car heat. That's why when, when I fly, like when I see the temperature is 25, humid, visible moisture, I don't care. Car heat on prior to landing because I need that on my go around. I don't need that because uh, go around, maybe idle, sorry, not go around. Prior to go around, right? Prior to go around, I, I have idle at right? 1500 RPM. Then the throttle valves become closed like this, the air faster and cool. And could, could lead you to carburetor icing. Then when you go around, it's already icing, then that's it, right? So turn on your anti icing. So we think more in the IFR. There's a cloud. It's not about I just turn around. Sometimes that's the only airway you can fly around. Right? If you go separate from the airway, there's obstacle limitation. So you guys know the airway, right? We have airway, specific airway. What we call that? What airway? Victor airways. Okay. The instrument there will be a low level instrument and high level instrument. Saleh will never fly in the low level anymore. You always fly like high level. So we fly the Victor airways. He always fly the J route, right? Because that's jet route. We fly the Victor Airways. So what the Victor Airways guarantee you? That's why I love instrument. Calms and uh, distance from obstacles. Mm -hmm. How how wide? There's numbers depending on the based on the GP. I think there's certain numbers, and then above a certain uh, altitude, there's based on fifty miles, sixty miles. Of All right. Time. So here's the thing: the Victor Airways is always designed by the minimum. IFR altitude. That's the key. Why do you want to fly IFR? Because it guarantees you to not hit anything. Then we call that minimum IFR altitude. In the Victor Airways, you have MEA, right? Minimum what? And rod altitude. What does it guarantee you? How high? It's a thousand feet or two thousand on the mountainous area. And how? What is the width? Two miles. It's a four miles, both sides. Four miles, both sides. Four and four. Okay. So you cannot just go avoid the clouds. When you call, okay, there's a thunderstorm, we request for deviation. Factor us to avoid the, the clouds, right? Especially when you're descending. Then maybe they will give you MVA. What's that MVA? The minimum factor altitude. They're not specific on the chart, but they know exactly what's the exact safe altitude for you. That's why we have to think, okay, on my route, I have clouds. Is that a thunderstorm cell there? No. Okay, that's fine. Is there any icing risk? Okay. No. If there is an icing risk, so then, thanks. Then we have to turn on our anti-icing. This thing we don't think when we fly VFR. Okay. Next page is like this. When you fly like this, it's not fun anymore. There's no joy, no fun if you're flying under a high sea. You feel fun, Sally, to fly this? <laughs> this is not flying. When I get trapped in this, I just pray, okay, can I go home now? <laughs> Why should I become a pilot? 
All right. So now about the pilot. We already discussed. You have to consistently take care of currency proficiency every six months, and the other biggest thing in the IFR is your loss communication. Your IMC white, and your radio out burned. What are you gonna do? Free. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do? Can you imagine that? Clouds all white, right? You're climbing, and you call pilot bar ten times, no reply. No joy. You're out. You fly to Malacca. What are you gonna do? The last, yes, last approved or last instructed, mm -hmm. and then if that doesn't work out, <coughs> you're gonna go down uh, as like as for files again. So think about that, right? <laughs> Is a <it> hijacking? <coughs> you get escort. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the thing, okay? The lost call. We're gonna discuss that in the next meeting, but at least that you're aware when you get a radio fail, all time the nav and the radio is separated. But now when you lost one radio, you lost all. That's a problem. And you should know the detail of the flight instrument system. What gonna happen if the pitot, right? The drain Pole clock. Reflect. The drain hole behind. Reflect. Mm -hmm. Because of icing, right? Even the people here as well? Yeah. Or let's take easier. How if the ramp and drain hole clock together? Glass. Break the glass. <laughs> that if you don't have the what glass? Yeah, which one? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, PSI because that's the lousiest one. You don't need that, right? <laughs> don't break the other manner. So the pito. What I'm trying to say here, you have to know all the instrument uh, system, the, all the six facts, airspeed indicator, right? How it works, what is the total pressure and dynamic pressure, static pressure stuff, and what happens is both clock. Then it's become like altimeter. When you climb, it's climb. Right? You have to know altimeter system, the VSI, what's the calibrated leak system. Just don't go too deep because you don't you are not a mechanic. But at least you know if something wrong, then you know how to troubleshoot it. Or maybe you, you have you only have to ignore that. Okay. So that's the thing. Flight instrument and should understand the personal minimums more than anything. I don't care if you fly the Jazz, you fly the G1000, the more important part, the most important part is your personal minimum, whether you are confident or not. Canceling the flight is no cost, but after you fly and all screen become white, 50% of your life gone. Okay, so you can always cancel the flight. Pilot must really understand the airplane performance to execute the parts procedures. This is the very, very, very important part. So do you know what I mean? Let's say you are departing, right? You're taking off. What is the minimum climb rate for instrument rating pilot? Instrument flight, I mean. Can you climb like poof, or maybe yellow or what's the standard? Because you cannot see anything, that's why they design the standard climb rate for IFR. Anyone know? How about you? Is it a percentage? Is it a gradient percentage? Climb gradient is for air transport category. But it's work similar way. 2.4% gradient is for the two engines. That's for the air transport category. We are talking about the old Cessna and Piper. Your fly MC from Zenai. 500 feet. It's 200 feet per nautical miles. That's the standard. How to convert that to become VSI? Feet per minute. So you times that your ground speed divided by 60. Okay? So that's a standard. That's a really, really standard. But how 
if you fly on the airport that has obstacle departure procedures. What does it mean? Can you think about this? Do you have a pen? Anyone have? Okay, can I borrow that? All right, so you're gonna fly here. Then they create a standard. This will be, am I right? Okay. This is the safest climb rate, the minimum climb rate. This is what we call obstacle clearance surface, OCS. That's the standard. So when there's a tree here, hit the slope, of the 152 feet per minute, fifth, uh, uh, foot per nautical mile, right? There's a tree, hit this slope, they will issue departure procedures, the obstacle departure procedures. And that may be not 200 feet per nautical mile anymore. That may be like 400, okay? The question is, can your airplane fly that procedures? Because a lot of people forget about this. They fly at Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe is 6,200 feet elevation, all right? And the runway is 18 and 36. If you're flying the departure procedures or runway 18 IFR, it requires you to climb 1,000 feet per minute, okay? The question, if you bring the old Cessna, can you climb 1,000 feet per minute? Mm -hmm. Then you request the clearance, you file a flat plan, they assume you know this, then all right, you fool with the families, all the baggage, right? Full weight, then the mm, runway is long, you can climb, right? You can live off. But can you climb 1,000 feet per minute? If you cannot climb 1,000 feet per minute, you may hit a tree. That's why a lot of people die because they don't understand the performance for IFR. On your private, you know the performance for landing roll, landing distance, that's it. Right? But we are talking about the departure procedures. If there's ODP, obstacle departure procedures, they require you to climb at a certain amount of climb gradient that will specifically uh, give you a relation between the weather, the temperature, the density altitude. Make sense? So what's density altitude anyway? So we can forget the G1000, you may forget to how to track the VOR because tracking the VOR, you can, you can just learn it like an hour but you cannot forget the density altitude because the density altitude, if you forget that, you will get killed. You never be killed by forgetting how to track the VOR. You can just confess, I'm lost, got me. But if you forget the density altitude, that's it. So. FAA private pilot check ride and commercial pilot check ride, they're really big on the density altitude. So anyone? Density altitude? What's the elevation here? 35, right? But the question is, is your airplane thinks that it is in the 35 feet? What do you mean? The thing is, whether it thinks it's on 35 feet. The plane. Uh -huh. So we know the elevation is 35 feet, right? Uh -huh. But when your airplane on the runway, the altimeter show you 35. Does the airplane think that it is on the 35 feet? That's on the temperature. Right? Yes. That's a pressure altitude, yes. But the real altitude that they feel it is the density altitude. It depends on your temperature. So let's say the temperature here is 35 degrees. If you have a calculator, you just open Google that density altitude calculator. You put the pressure altitude, the the pressure, right, the one zero one whatever, and then the temperature, the dew point. You will find that the airport elevation now is not thirty five; it's become eight hundred. Hmm. So you think that you are thirty five, but your airplane feels they are sitting on the eight hundred feet altitude. Now it matters. So your ground roll. Landing distance is not, is not calculated by the pressure altitude. It's always calculated by the density altitude because you have temperature. When the, when the pressure altitude gets corrected for the non-standard temperature, you get a density altitude. 
then that will impact your what? The climb performance. performance. Especially when you go transition to the multi engine, you can fly both engine with 2,000 RPM with a semi mole uh, to 2,000 feet per minute. It's easy. But how if you lost one engine? The temperature now is 38. You lost one engine. You lost one engine. You lost 50% of power, right? But you lost 80% of performance. You can climb 2,000 feet per minute with two engines. But with the weather, the temperature getting hotter, like 35 degrees, you can only climb 200 feet per minute. Do you believe me? Open the charts, find out. That's why when I say, don't get multi-engine rating if you if you are not studying. That the, the only license to kill you. You fly the multi-engine, you are not proficient. You fly hot weather like this, you're climbing, right? You lost your one engine, boom. So that's the density altitude, man, right? Now, I, as an instrument rating pilot, you always connect the obstacle departure procedure or SID, your airplane performance, and your weather, the temperature, the density, the altitude. That's the three items. You have to connect it together. On the VFR, you don't care. You just think about can I land at Human Island with the, this weight, the landing roll, and if I cannot make it, can I go around? That's it, right? But in the IFR, no. The three items. What is that? Weather, density, altitude. The weather, density, altitude, and density and performance, of course, right? Weather and density, weather and density, altitude is number one. Aircraft performance and the departure procedures. Okay, SID or ODP is is two different things. But we are not talking about that. But that's the main idea. You have to be able to connect three items. Okay, don't. Don't take any SID before you check whether your airplane can handle that. And the, unfortunately, there are only like very little notes about that. And normally it's on the really back page of the approach plate. It's really small like that. You need 800 feet per nautical miles for this departure. So nobody read about that. That's why they keep asking you on the check ride. All right. So the study case, let me give you a homework, you can send it to me. You're going to fly from here to Malacca. I need you to make a flight plan. You can send it to me, I'll give you a review and feedback. The study case, this is the real one, maybe you can fly it one day. From Selitar, uh, how many miles there to Malacca? 109. How do you know that? Because it's written. Where? <laughs> the color box. Red color. Sky back there. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that? One uh, night. One right here. I think. Below the okay. Yeah. But if there's no. It looks like Australia. We can 68 plus 30. Uh, 68. Yeah, I think, 90, I think 98, 90, right? Yeah, 98. 98. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so do we have um, minimum altitude here? Uh, I don't see minimum air route altitude, but I see it on the Victor 535. After yeah. that, yeah. Re, uh, if you compare to the Alpha 457, about that is 4500, right? Yeah. And after mass ball intersection, that will be 6500. So the NEA will guarantee you to get a navigation a signal and obstacle clearance. Maybe 6000 here will be fine. What's your altitude for West heading? 6,000, right? It's yeah. even, right? Okay, so how if the MEA is 6,500, what's your altitude? 8,000. 8,000. So get your flight plan. This is 98 miles. Use your current weather. Let's say you make it like two days from now or whatever you want to make it. Just use the present weather. Choose your altitude, wherever you want. And what the thing is here, the next page, is how to depart from Salitar. Is there any SID or ODP or diverse procedures? There's a diverse procedures. That's a diverse procedure. Okay, so anyone know about the diverse procedures? All right, you fly from the airport, there's no obstacle departure procedures. When there is uh, trees, like I said before, there's a trees 
crossing the 150 foot per nautical mile slope, they will issue the ODP. If there's no ODP, then you will go for diverse procedure. What's diverse procedures? The first is, what is the takeoff definition? What is takeoff? No, the takeoff is end of the runway, 35 foot. That will be the takeoff terminology. So when you take off, number two, no turn before 400 feet AGL. Number three, 200 feet per nautical miles. That's a diverse procedure. And the diverse procedure, if that issue for the airport, that will give you a clearance 25 miles around the airport, or 46 miles if there's a mountainous area, is guarantee you not hit anything. And as long as you are not turning before. 400 feet AGL and you maintain 200 feet per minute uh, per nautical mile and based on that diverse procedures they will issue the diverse factor area before you get to the MEA if you have to turn right the ATC will give you minimum factor altitude that's on the diverse factor area okay so SID ODP or the diverse procedures what's this 200 and the 152 again okay yeah. um, <coughs> So imagine this is a runway, right? This is the safest climb rate, the 152. We call that OCS, Obstacle Clearance Surface, all right? And the IFR minimum is 200. So every one mile will give you 48, 96 margin from the Minimums. You get it? Yes, so the minimum is 200, but they calculate the OCS is 152. So the climb gradient is based on this. On every thousand, you get 24. Okay? So what is this? The 48, the, the distance between this, we call that required obstacle clearance, ROC. So if you fly Airbus, you fly 2.4%, right? When you fly 10 miles from your departure point, departure 35 feet, you will get a thousand feet ROC. It means the, the deviation here, you have a thousand feet margin with the 2.4% climb gradient. That's what matters. Because all in the 2.4% is all about the single engine. The KRH is not about the normal. It's all about if you lose one engine, can you maintain that climb gradient? That's it. Okay. So as a single engine pilot, what you concern is can you maintain 200 feet per nautical mile to beat the OCS? All right. So that's the OCS. So that's what you want to know as informal rating pilot. How to join the airport airway? Because all the departure procedure is all the thing about to bring you, all right, to bring you from the surface to the airway. So this is the airway. You're coming from this, right? How to bring you to join the freeway? Let's say this is the highway. So you go, you, you're gonna fly from here to here. How to bring you from this point to this point? Then we have the departure procedure. So how to fly, uh, what's, the, what's the area name? Fix, uh, whiskey 543. How to join that airway from here? What do you think? Is there any SID in Salinar? No. No SID, right? So, is there any ODP? No. So, the only way to join that is weather factor. Right? So, the clearance will be climb runway heading 3000, um, left turn after how many miles DME and join Fitner Airways that are issued on navigation. That's it. And you have to track it. All right. Number two, this answer to join the airlock airway will be a rather factor. Number three, can your airplane performance flight the departure procedures? We already discussed that. What is the weather on the arrival time? Do we need an alternate? The question is, do we need to file alternate? If um, the weather at the arrival is or uh, one hour after is below minimum. And one hour before and one hour one after hour the ceiling. How about the ceiling? Less than 2,000. And the feasibility less than 3, 7 miles. Then you have to have alternate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
The question is how to choose the alternate, right? Now you're gonna fly instrument. Then you realize that, geez, based on the TAF, when I get there, the weather is below that one to three things. It's below 2,000 and below 3,000 miles. And what's your consideration to choose the alternate? Of the weather. So it means it means that you cannot fly to that alternate if there's a weather. So don't choose that. Don't choose that alternate. Don't so you that. have to choose the VFR alternate. How if there's no VFR alternate? You fly uh, from here to San Francisco, all right? In the middle of the Pacific, you just got a news. Okay, when you get there, the weather is there. It's below the minimums. All this. Northern California and the Southern California will be all icing and IMC. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Go back? Transit at Guam? Honolulu? There we go. So, the IMC weather is doesn't mean you cannot land. Choosing the alternate is doesn't mean that you have to take the alternate. It's just to file the alternate. But, what is the procedure? It's not procedure. What's the common sense to choose the alternate first? Just don't choose the airport, it's like 25 miles to the airport because the weather will be the same. Just choose like 50 or 70 miles, right? And number two, what else? Just for, the regulation is the alternate must have instrument approach procedures, right? And then that alternate, what is the alternate? Why, why do you need to have like instrument approach procedures? What are the consideration of the weather? You have to know what's the weather there. If, if you choose ILS on the alternate, then you have to take a look at your path. The ceiling must be at least 600 feet. If you choose if that airport is only half UR, then that path, the weather, when you choose the alternate, must be at least 800 feet and to set amount of visibility. Otherwise, you cannot even choose that as your alternate. Okay, so that's the answer. Do you need alternate? Yes, the one, two, three thing rules. Otherwise, then just but for me, it's always good if you fly like more than 200 miles, you always have your backup plan, the alternate, right? But it doesn't have to be VFR, it could be IMC as well. But maybe there's no thunderstorm. Because why we have to execute the alternate, maybe there's a wind shear or the visibility is zero or maybe there's a thunderstorm just above the airport, you cannot fly or there's an icing, then you have to execute to the other airport which is the same IMC, but no cloud is just stable weather, just a hazy layer or something like that, right? And what's the fuel requirement? Plus 30? Minutes. Mm -hmm. 30, 30 minutes, 30 minutes for IFR, I mean, mm -hmm. 30 minutes for IFR. Anyone? You're gonna try? Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. IFR? Mm -hmm. So why are we concerned about this? <coughs> it's all about your weight and balance, how many fuel you can Bring. If you fly from here to Penang, then you know that I'm not gonna make it because headwind or whatever. Then you have to define, decide. Okay, maybe I stop in Malacca, refuel, and go because I have to comply with the fuel requirement, the Part 91 fuel requirement. What's that for IFR? So you have to have the fuel from point A to point B. You have to have a fuel to the alternate plus 45 minutes on the cruise power. Okay, the three layers. That's it. If you cannot make it because you have to bring all the um, stuff, the surfing stuff, fishing stuff, then you have to find a place to refuel. That will um, change your flight plan, change your whole day plan, right? What's your airplane equipment to accept the instrument approach procedures? Be careful. If you don't have DME, then you shoot the approach to maybe uh, Penang or whatever, then every approach plate will give you DME required. Can you shoot that approach? No. Right. So practically, even though you are instrument rating pilot and the airplane is IFR certified, you cannot even shoot that approach because all the instrument approach will require you to have DME. Then when the weather become bad, it just seems like a VFR. So you have to know what's the specific equipment required by that specific approach. All right. So, see the suitable approach procedure and star if needed. 
If you're not familiar with DMER, don't do the DMER. Okay. And that's the VR approach. Let's open the Malacca VR approach. I have one there. So you're going to fly to Malacca. What you're going to do is I need you to have this. I have two copies. So this is AIP. In US, you have charge supplement, right? So everything about Malacca. As instrument rating pilot, you have to read this and every single detail. What's the procedures, what's the backup plan, what's the emergency, and whatever in here. Because the, this is the new game. I've never been to Malacca. So when I'm gonna fly there, that's why I print this. I will study from front to back, the whole. All right, so that's the thing. Now we, op now we open the Malacca VR Yankee. So you're coming from, um, open the error chart, whiskey 543, from what radial is that? What's the radial? 117, right? So in this case, from the Malacca, from the approach chart, where are you going to be? From the southeast, right? So you're coming from the southeast to the Malacca VR. Let's say there's no factors, you have to go to do the full approach. How you get into the VR Yankee Malacca? You're coming from the southeast. Radial 117. Sorry? Probably you enter at the whatever height that you last at. Let, let's talk about the rod first, and then we talk about the altitude. Right? So how to execute this approach for the full approach? Okay. November to one eight zero echo. Uh, due to the traffic, just shoot for the full approach. Then what you gonna do? So we do a sector entry to the hole. Do you need a hole there? Um, probably not. So what's the difference between the bold line and the thick line and the regular line? Thick line and the regular line. Which one is that? The this one? Yeah. That's the procedural turn? Yeah. So that's a procedure turn. Then you have to come in with the procedure turn. So from Malacca, what heading are you gonna do? B? 206, right? Yeah. You're gonna turn to 06 unless they ask you to hold. Yep. You turn to 06 and then what? Six miles, make a right turn, two, five, one. All right. And then I think if you don't have DME, how to identify the six PMK? We got six. Time. Time? Just read, read carefully on the chart. Every information you need is published on the chart. You fly to one edge of echo and you just realize the DNA broken. You follow this time. Ah, there you go. And the speed. Yeah. So <coughs> what kind of speed you want to just find And the weather now is official. <coughs> Marginal VFR. <coughs> what are you gonna do? Who has instrument rating here? Okay. Except Saleh. Except you. One. Okay. Can tell you. You can tell All right. Take a look to the top of the chart. DME VM. There you go. So when you get DME error, can you shoot this approach? No. No. All right. What are you gonna do? Request visual approach. We got DME failure. Request PS visual, uh, request writer factor to final if they give it to you or visual approach. Make sense? Now you have your DME back. Then at the six DME, what are you gonna do? Heading to <laughs> to five one. Until when? Twelve. 
Until when? Twelve. What? Twelve p.m. How do you know twelve p.m. I saw the chart. It turns following is twelve. How? Oh, how to see that? The oh, okay. The scale. Yeah. Is that right? It depends on the speed then, right? Based on. Yeah, twelve p.m. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah, it's just based on the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can use that as reference, yeah. 12 DME, huh? Okay. Agree? Exactly. So it's like 6 DME outbound. Yeah. Alright. Or time, right? The procedure term has a time. One minute procedure term. Okay. So one minute go out or 12 DME and then you turn back to 071. What we call this is the course reversal, the procedure turn. Then after that, when you go to 026. How to bring you in? After you get heading to 071, how to get you back to when you intercept the course? Local yeah, yeah, until you intercept the not the localizer, no, the, the, yeah, the VOR, VOR. <laughs> it's like the final approach course. They will give you, after you turn, then they will give you November 21808 code. What's the magic word of instrument? Clear for the approach. What happens if they give you clear for the approach? What does it mean? Why is a magic word? It just kills you for the first right? Doesn't mean you're clear to end. What, what's the meaning of clear for the approach? Can descend. Can descend from where? From you can descend from your initial approach phase yeah. to shoot your final approach phase. That's the point. Yeah. Unless they give it to you there, it means you have to hold there. In the IF, right? You know that. So you intercept 1600 altitude and you're gonna descend, right? Descend to where? Okay. Where are you gonna descend? Your own first one. Alright, you're gonna descend to your minimum descent altitude. What's that? Uh, 450. Yes, 450. And what does it mean for 32? AGL. AGL, yeah. Can you fly AGL? How can you get the AGL information with the Piper? Oh, you minus the weight elevation. Can you get it? If you dial it to a... Uh, Saleh can get it because he has a radio altimeter. You cannot get a DH. Oh, you, okay. It's only DH, right? That should be a radio altimeter. Ask him why to put a new radio altimeter and, yeah, and with the GBWS. Standard, standard pressure minus. <laughs> Alright, so you descend to that point. How to descend? Slowly, nice and smooth or 500 feet per minute or what? I think it's a constant real descent. After 450, you mean? No, uh, after yeah. you have the final approach fix, you descend, right? Uh, so the non -position. How to execute that? You descend right away there, or you then descend slowly, nice and smooth, or what? <laughs> Alright, so, non precision approach. Yeah, you cannot go below the 450. No Rule of thumb, okay? There, there are two ways to descend. You can descend from here, nice and smooth, go there. Oh, to yeah. the MDA, right? Boom. Boom. Or yeah. you can go here. Boom. Go down. We call this dive and drive. Yeah. We call this. So, FAA, small airplane, they choose this. The faster you go down, break the clouds, the safer for you. Always put 100, 100 feet above the MDA. Alright? You descend, 700. That's the, the, the common rule of thumb for non precision approach. 700 feet per minute and descend. Okay, what is your what is your misapproach point? How to identify your misapproach point? 1.2. 1 1.2, 1 right? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yep. Um, does the MD cater for at the MD at the end the misapproach point? Does it cater for obstacle yeah. obstacle clearance all the way to FAA? You know, like the like we we spoke about the diamond drive. So. I was just oh yeah, that. yeah. So, so it's actually hit up off ground. That clear you 200 feet above. Uh, 250. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
So if you're following that MBA, it doesn't give you a ROC, the Commander of Second Korean is 250 feet, 200 or 250, I have to check it. Okay? You know what he means? It's a good question. I had a question. So you descend and dive and drive, you descend far away before the missile approach, you already level at 450. Is that guarantee you to clear for the clearance? That's a good one. So the answer is yes. That's why in the check ride, if you're down below that, you're gonna fail. It's a minus zero plus 100. That's why we always put 100 feet above. So tell the examiner, okay, my target is 550 to give a cushion just in case it's bumpy or something, right? Because if you less than 450, it will fail you right away. No excuse. Because that's MBA. You level it off there. It's not DA. DA is just boom, go, right? It's just like three. See the point? All right. So how to identify this approach point? 1.2 DME. Yeah. 1.2 DME. Now, is there another way to find the beast approach point there? Time. Time. Okay. So what's your approach speed? Make it 90. When do you start the timing? Pass FAF. Pass FAF, right? Okay. There's another way to treat the MDA as a DA. We use the CDFA. So what's your rate of descent? You can use this. This is the MDA, right? And this is the maze approach. You can treat this like a DA. By descending nice and smooth, hit the MDA, runway not inside, maze approach point, go. The CDFA. Use the you see the rate of descent three degrees? At the 90 knots ground speed, it will be 460 instead of 700. So it's depend on your procedures. But you uh, it's depend you want to go down and uh, level at the MBA, or you want the nice and smooth following the three degree slope. All right. Then if you execute the miss, what's the procedure of the miss? Read the misapproach, climb on 0 to 6 to 1500, right? Turn right, track to VMK, and hold. Then you think, at the misapproach, you already know if I have to miss, what is my holding entry? Direct. Alright, go ahead. What's your holding entry? Direct. Right. Roy? That will be a drag, right? Drag entry, then you hold there 2500, one minute, and then you try to shoot again. If you want to exit, hold, and to shoot another few hours, how to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he said you are clear for the approach. Resume on F. Report and establish the final report course. What are you gonna do? Same zero. You're gonna do the same. same do same another same procedure same turn, same right? As simple as that. Unless he give you a factor. So that's all. If you choose this VR, it's easy, huh? But you have to brief this before you enter the airplane. Put all the notes. Alright, just always assume that the weather is MC. Alright, so this is the end of the course. Any questions? Let's get the three questions. Go ahead. So at least you got a workflow of um, how to fly, and I want you to make a flight plan. Download the NAFLOG, or Joe, can you send them the NAFLOG? As a flat planner, yeah. choose the route, choose the altitude, calculate the performance, the landing distance. Just make a real one, like you want to fly. Send it to me. I'll, I'll give um, 
feedback on that? So say if you are, you are same thing we are going to Maratabao is on a DMC or VFR flight. Uh -huh. right? So generally when the, the weather comes, is uh, we always have that problem where it's, it's not you know, clear blue skies and suddenly you are IMC. So it's generally the, it gets worse, it gets worse, it starts to deteriorate. Yeah. You keep thinking, I can still see. Mm -hmm. And then you start to go and suddenly that's where it starts to deteriorate and before you know it, let's say you enter. So what do you do next when you mentioned earlier if I'm already in and I requested to change to IFR, mm -hmm. suppose that if we are all IFR, we are IR rated, right? Yeah. Uh, I, IR, uh, once we go in and then we request to change for VFR to IFR, we, we don't do that, so what do we do? Before you enter the clouds. Yeah, but now it's in an in a event where it's inadvertent, where it, we didn't expect it to happen, mm -hmm. right? Well, we just got caught, like, caught up in it. You see that the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. You know the basic VFR weather minimums? You still remember that? Uh, no. Sorry. You're flying the control airspace, three mile visibility. You have to maintain 2,000 horizontal, 2,000 feet from the clouds, 1,000 feet above, 500 okay. below. If you, can, if you cannot maintain that separation, you have to change to IFR right away. So you know there's a cloud, there's no way you to deviate. You know you have to pass through that, right? Then you have to change right away before you touch that. And in a VFR, how far do you, are we allowed to deviate from our right? It's up to you. Oh, it's, it's, it's VFR, right? Yeah, it's I, up I, to I, you. I because no, actually, you, to point. Point. you said you should point at the point. You can do ho 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 then you continue. Okay, so I, see, I, see. I see, I see. I see. I see. I see. get restricted by them. Mm -hmm. well, of course, they will warn you. That's the one you, you mentioned, the four miles. Yeah, yeah. because they have like Victor Airways guarantee you four miles. Otherwise, you will get a factor. Factor to um, deviation from the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is no guarantee. Then, you will use the Oroca and AQ, they use the word uh, Grid Mora, okay. but in US, Oroca. So it's off route obstacle clearance. I'll do it. That's a minimum uh, field elevation. Mm. It's different, but it's the same. The concept is the same. And the, uh, the box, uh -huh. the quadrangle box, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. There's a number. Yeah. Okay, IFR, we call that a Grid Mora or Oroca, okay. and the VFR is uh, minimum field out elevation, M MFE. So basically that same. Okay. So if you are oh okay, so basically you're saying we won't be we, we, are, we are not supposed to be caught up in it. Yeah, that's why what happened between me and Dr. Young is we flew and uh, I wasn't double eye that time and, and my knowledge is not really good on the IFR. I know my IFR is that's my weakest point. Then I train myself to understand the whole racks and how the applications for the real life scenario. So in that video, I damn stupid. I just entered the, the clouds and then I call SoCal, change to IFR and they're busy. And, and they was busy and finally they say that, okay, if you want to sh uh, shoot the practice or whatever, that there's a clouds above the Van Nuys. And that ATC, I, I believe he did a mistake as well. He already understand that we are inside the clouds. I said, I'm inside the clouds. And he keep talking just like maintain VFR. I already told him I'm inside the clouds, right? Because maybe he's busy. And then I already in the clouds, I switched to IFR. That is a heavy pilot deviation. So if, if we, are, we are caught in that situation, what's the right thing to do? Declare emergency. Yeah. So it's a. Yeah. You would have you, to right away declare emergency. Would you do that or would you do a 180 and head out of the clock first? No. It, so basically, if you cannot maintain the separation 2,000 feet horizontally, you have to have, you have to be in the IFR flight plan, IFR flight, because for the traffic separation. Yeah, okay. Do you continue or do you do a one eighty eight? Oh, get out. You have far away to IFR. Yeah. No, it's, it's your personal minimum. Mm -hmm. There's no right or no. Yeah. We, we, we can't answer mm -hmm. that. That's a decision making. Mm -hmm. it, this one is based on uh, experience. Mm -hmm. You one time you go inside, another time you will not want to go inside the situation. And in, in this season, the clouds, uh, the weather is uh, change very fast. Yeah. So if you can go out, hold, wait for the weather to clear, then you uh, carry on. But how if you are get caught, right? And there's a lot of uh, clouds near you. I will choose right straight away because if you turn, you will get more load factor. Depend on the color of the clouds. Yeah. If it is black color. Magenta, you die. 
Imagine how you like. It, it's just really good. Sometimes you come and they, you know, you see dark blue, black. I will do it. I think we flew the 2180 or I and uh, Dr. Rakesh. Mm. So we are coming back. After Melaka, Moa, black. Mm. I cannot go in. The only way is go around. I, I think I'm in the middle of the intuition and, and mm. intuition. So go then to Johor. It's still IMC. But this time the clouds are white, uh, so that's where I say that I will track vision. So in vision, some people will just won't clear them. Mm. How emergency do you plan You can ask. Uh, don't do no, no. 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 Just ask factors. Yeah. Oh, but legally, you have to declare emergency. Yeah. What kind of emergency? It's just we declare emergency. We're yeah. inside the clouds on the VFR. Okay. You see, you difficulty that I'm in VFR VMC. Oh, unable to. Uh, let's say it's Paya Lebar, right? Mm -hmm. Paya Lebar approach November two one eight zero echo. We declare emergency. We are inside the clouds um, on the VFR. That's it. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. And request factor. If you don't declare emergency, possible pilot deviation, mm -hmm. because all about you're gonna hit somewhat inside the clouds. Okay. So a lot of people complain. And that become like viral on Reddit, reddit.com. Mm. And my friend, the owner of Pilot Age, called me. We have like talk, and I, I told him that's a year ago. And after that, I become CFI, and I will lie, and please talk to the FA inspector. And then I made my flock learn from my mistake, and I admit that publicly in the YouTube. And I teach them how to not become like me. That's the only way. Confess. Make a publication, that's it. Otherwise, they will hunt you and maybe they want to talk with you. But the FAA, how they work, unless there is no unless there is accidents, they talk with you. Otherwise, then they don't want the, they don't like the paperwork. Because after that, I keep upgrading my uh, ratings, right? Then I become CFI, double I, so discovered. But always remember from my mistake, never touch the clouds before you turn to IFR. Never ever. How is the transition like for VFR to IFR? So so what's your what's your what's the end state they want to? So for example you have a VFR flight route, then now you said I'm uh, intending to switch over to IFR. Mm -hmm. So so what's next? We we will provide them with uh what's the, the points that we wanna go and what kind of approach you wanna shoot? Yeah, let's say uh, Pile Ever November two one eight zero we have requests. Okay. And then uh, go ahead. November two one eight zero B A twenty eight slash uniform uh, five thousand, right? Uh, we request I for clearance for yeah request I for clearance that's it okay. to um, Penang due to weather. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing in Malaysia they ask you give you a lot of points like mass for yeah, yeah so so this is the, the, the part where I was confused about so in the air if for example you say no I would like to request a uh, uh, I for clearance into um, Malacca, for example, and then you say, okay, clear I found Do you give you factors or will they? That's why you say PA28 slash uniform. Because you are. You are they know that you slash uniform, you have transponder, yes. you have DME, but you don't have GPS. Mm -hmm. Then if you have GPS, you say you're slash gold. Mm -hmm. They will give you all the RNF rods. So on the end, they'll start to plot you yeah. rods and then you start to yeah, fly. You track the view or not. Yeah. 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 Um, fly to Marno. How to get Marno? Sabus. Okay. Cannot. If without a 430, you can't do that. Yeah. You, you cannot go, go. Unless you bring your, your Garmin, but it's not certified for a charge, boat, right? right? <laughs> it's <to> open the <laughs> There's no any charge. I see. I mean, you cannot connect that with the Victor Airways or, or anything. That's a like specific thing. Okay. There's no cross radial. I see, I see. So, that's all. Alright. So, I will email you. If you're looking for the instrument ground, uh, we're gonna make it a ground school for instrument, the short ground school, give you a basic understanding, throw you all the um, scenario base like this because your check route will be like this. You make a flat plan, we will throw you with all the scenario, all the race thing, then you have to tell the story about that, right? So that will be three days. I upload, uh, I give you um, the flyers there behind. If you want to improve and try to get a train in the AATD and then after that you can use the Piper or Cessna I can fly with you to make sure that you understand how's the real world of instrument, the limitation, right? So feel free to join 
and I'm really happy to share more. Right? Is this in US or Jakarta? Um, Jakarta, Jakarta or Singapore. Uh, Preferring Jakarta because we have the ATD there and uh, you can be there like 24 hours, it's up to you. So actually, what we, our culture is we don't count on our basis. I hate that because when I learn to fly, when my instructor always count, okay, you already learn like five, six hours, right? You feel that, right? So after that hours, they don't want to even talk with you. That always happened in US. I hate that. So it's like a contract, okay? I will make you understand in three days, whatever. We'll teach you until you pass out. Until you say, okay, give up, I want to sleep, boom. Yeah, normally we start a class 9 to 8 p.m. It's all 12 or 15 hours. We cover all the stuff there. Then maybe that's the best transition for you to jump to the 10 days instrument because that will be a hard, challenging part for getting an instrument in 10 days. Because now the oral is deeper and deeper. The oral exam will be two and a half to three hours. Cover everything, every legend, every single legend on the chart. Um, risk management and then the system and your decision making they will give you like five or six scenarios mostly 75% is lost comp the lost communication is the huge part all right so thank you very much for the class do your homework send it to me I'll send you a feedback of the flat plan and maybe we can have a chance to fly together to Malacca and practice that all right, guys, thank you very much. Let's take a picture. Celebrate.